grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. You know, there are two times when every angel ever created gathered together to praise God for his marvelous works. The first time is at the dawn of creation in the text that I just read. The second time is at the birth of Christ. The morning stars, the angels themselves that once sang at the dawn of creation, they now sing at the dawn of the incarnation. A song that we sing as well when we sing glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. They sing because Jesus Christ is God become man. And when God becomes man with skin and eyelashes and elbows, nothing is ever the same again. He who once spoke the universe into existence, who fashioned man from the dust of the earth, now wraps himself in the dust of the earth, weaving himself into one with DNA and human cells, knitting himself together with our humanity in his virgin mother's womb. God becoming man. And at this, the angels shout for joy, filling Bethlehem's skies with their praises. So let us rejoice as well in the mystery of God made man by singing our exordium hymn. This is hymn 391. pray together. Most merciful God, you gave your eternal word to become incarnate of the pure virgin. Grant your people grace to put away fleshly lusts, that they may be ready for your visitation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Amen. Well, in John's account, the more familiar elements of the Christmas story they're, they're stripped away. We hear no singing angels. We follow no searching shepherds. And there's no indication of a humble manger. Instead, we're given a glimpse into the immense and the profound mystery of the Word who was with God, who is God, and how that Word became flesh. John records the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that word dwelt is translated, that's translated rather dwelt, is tabernacled, tented. The Word became flesh and tabernacled with us. This recalls the Old Testament tabernacle and all the theology that came along with it all being brought down to us then in the flesh of Jesus. So let's back up a bit in order to really get a running start at this verse. 
We remember first with a bit of horror how it was in the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve sinned. They clothed themselves with fig leaves, but that, that wasn't all. When they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the cool of the garden, they ran. They hid from God. And that's terrible when you think about it. And that in and of itself is spiritual death. I mean, think about the people on occasion, and I know you do it because I do it too, but think about the people from time to time that you avoid. Maybe even the day when you go to a family gathering and there's Uncle Louie. There he is. And we try to maybe avoid Uncle Louie. Why? Because we don't want to be around him. They didn't want to be around God. So much so that they ran and hid from him. When they hear the footsteps of God approaching, they should have done what? Run to him. But you see, the effect of the fall has already started to manifest itself. It's horrible that Adam and Eve run and hide from the presence of the Lord. But at the same time, it's a right response. Because Adam and Eve know almost instinctively that it's not safe for them to stand before God anymore. It's no longer safe for them to be in the presence of God, for God's holiness now becomes a consuming holiness. And it wasn't like that before the fall. Before Adam and Eve could walk and talk and share in a communion with God that was flawless, perfect. But now, that ship has sailed, and they hide. Why? Because the presence of God is dangerous for sinners. For Adam and Eve, for you, for me. Meaning that if God shows up in His unveiled glory, we are consumed. But you heard it from me last night if you were here. Something like this happens after God rescues His people from Egypt and brings them out into the wilderness. There the glory of the Lord descends upon Mount Sinai where He gives them the Ten Commandments and the people actually say, don't talk to us anymore. We can't take it. They say, Moses, you go up the mountain, you let God talk to you, and then you come back and you tell us. We can take it coming from you, we can't take it coming from Him. People cannot take the direct word of God because it is too much. It's dangerous. And even though it's horrible to consider, it's right that the people say this. They are right that they cannot handle God's presence. They are right in that they cannot handle God's glory. In fact, you might recall God telling Moses in Exodus 32, no one can look upon my face and live. This is not because the face of God is destructive. The face of God is glorious. The face of God is wonderful beyond our imagining. The face of God is holy and perfect. And that's the problem. We're not holy. Nor are we perfect. We're fallen sinners. We are unholy and we are unfit for the presence of God. You know, so many Christians foolishly assume that they can have this direct encounter with God, this unmediated experience with God, super high octane, 200 proof. What they don't realize is that is not safe. For if we sinners were able to simply sashay into the presence of God, we would be just like Isaiah of old when he encountered God. You remember? High and lifted up in Isaiah 6. At that moment, Isaiah felt like he was unraveling, that he was coming out of his skin, that he was coming apart at the seams. And this is why God gave instructions to Moses to build a tent. 
the tabernacle so that God could be in the midst of his people without destroying them. The Lord wanted an address right in the middle of the camp. So he institutes a way so as to hide his glory that he might dwell with his people without destroying them. By the way, I'll make a commercial here for adult Bible study when we begin again on January 7th. We're looking at the book of Revelation verse by verse, line by line, chapter by chapter. And guess how the book of Revelation ends? With God being among his people. Just like Adam and Eve in the garden. And so this was a type. It was a shadow of that. He institutes a way to hide his glory so that he might dwell with his people without destroying them. And that's what the tabernacle is. That's what the tent is. That's what the sacrifices are. That's why the priesthood is established. It's so God can dwell in the midst of his people without destroying them or consuming them in his wrath over their sin. God hides himself so that he can bless. Covering himself with the tent, the blood and the sacrifices so that he can be there with his people to bless them. So hear it again. John says, the word became flesh and tabernacled among them. Which means that now the glory of God is hidden in the flesh of Jesus. And it's for the exact same reason. It's so that he does not destroy us, but rather bless us, forgive us, save us. Get that. Jesus wraps his glory in the humility of our own flesh and blood so that he can be our brother, so that he can walk in our midst, so that he can teach the people, heal the people, and provide a way back to the glory of God. Jesus in the flesh means that when they hear him walking, they don't have to run away from him like Adam and Eve did. No, they can come and they can find him and they can be blessed by him. And by dressing up in our humility, by God eventually, or excuse me, eternally wrapping himself in our flesh, this is what makes him, beloved, Emmanuel, God with us. He's not God far away. Rather, a God very near and a God who wants to be with his people. He's not avoiding you like you avoid Uncle Louie. He wants to be near. Beloved, the Word did not become flesh so that you might have a few days off from work, experience some warm fuzzies, and enjoy some quality family time. The Word became flesh to pay the awful price for your sin with His flesh being nailed to the cross and His blood draining from His lifeless veins by which you are forgiven. The Word became flesh to baptize you into His death and his resurrection, that you might be his child now and for all eternity. The word became flesh to drink to the dregs the cup of God's wrath so that you might drink only the cup of his salvation. So what happens in the incarnation is God making a way for us to stand before him without being destroyed, without being consumed. It's what he's doing in the forgiveness of your sins. It's what he's doing when he feeds you his holy body and his precious blood. It's what he's doing when he's preaching his word in your very ears. And beloved, when Jesus comes again in glory, he's going to indicate it not with footsteps, but with trumpets. Not with, where are you? but with the voice of the archangel, with the shout of God. And when we hear this, we will not be like Adam and Eve, running and hiding. 
Because of what Jesus has done, when you hear that sound, you will turn toward your God and you will run to Him so that you can be in His presence. Even Jesus said it like this in Luke 21. And when these things come to pass, His second advent, when He returns again in glory, does He say, run and hide, scatter, run for your life? No, He says, look up. And lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. All because of what Jesus has done. And you together, with the angels and the archangels, and all the company of heaven, will be safe and will rejoice eternally. So church, sing with the angels this day. Why? Because the Word has become flesh and has dwelt, has tabernacled among us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We stand together. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. We continue with